Welcome to the Levin Center's annual Public Service Awards Dinner. Um, I have to admit that this is probably my favorite event of the law school year um, because we really come together to celebrate. I wasn't that, okay, thank you. Um, public service, not just in our community, which is an amazing community, um, but to really celebrate two accomplished lawyers two extraordinary examples of how we can use legal tools to advance justice, as well as to protect and enforce Im uh, important rights and to define new ones. And I would like to begin, um, as I usually do at this event, with an acknowledgement of and heartfelt thanks to the Levin family. For those of you who are new to the law school, um, and to have wondered exactly who John and Terry Levin might be, well, this is John, and thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you do, and his daughter, Caroline. Um, and his wife, Terry, unfortunately, couldn't be with us tonight because she was in San Francisco rooting on another team that she supports. Um, so tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Um, the Levin's generosity has really placed Stanford in the enviable position of having one of the very few endowed centers at a law school whose entire focus, think about it, entire focus is to support our law school community of students and alumni and faculty and staff in their pursuits of, of public service, but also to support the healthy development of the public interest legal field itself. We are indeed very fortunate. So with the Levin support, as well as that of our dean, Liz McGill, our center at Stanford serves a unique role in the public interest world through both its scope and its vision. We are increasingly taking on important projects ex externally in the field through research that informs the broader public interest legal profession. We think about this work now within a framework of creating a pipeline of sustainable and supported public interest lawyers. As generational and demographic shifts are taking place in the field generally, we want to raise and explore important questions about how the sector can provide for viable long-term careers for lawyers in the public interest and become a, se a sector that attracts and also keeps, nurtures, and develops leaders. When I think about the women we are honoring tonight, one thing that strikes me is the breadth of kinds of lawyering that they each have employed in their impressive careers. For those of you aspiring to join their ranks as public interest lawyers and leaders, take note. Take note of the ways they have been able to deploy the tools of our trade to advance their causes and represent their clients be it through traditional litigation or engaging in policy advocacy at City Hall, in the state capitol, or the nation's capitol at that. They have written op-eds, tweets, blogs, and briefs. They have stood with clients in protest. They have raised those clients' stories in courtrooms and in the court of public opinion on CNN with USA Today, The Times, The Post, Univision. They have been members of collaborations with other legal groups and community members, organizers, faith leaders, and labor unions, dreamers, and libertarians. And knowing both Maria Elena and Catherine a bit, as I do, as I'm fortunate to, they have also served as mother hens, providing hugs and encouragement at just the right moment for client and colleague alike. My hope is that those of you who came to this law school with public service ambitions and those who may just be discovering them tonight will be confident in your pursuit of those ambitions with these role models in mind. And confident, as confident as am I and all of us at the law school in your ability to achieve them and in the fact that our society and our world will be a better place when indeed you do. Now, before continuing with the program, I just want to thank the remarkable staff of the Levin Center that does so much to build the public interest community here and in the field. A particular thanks to Anna Wang and Holly Parrish, who really put together this entire event tonight. And my gratitude flows equally to T.T. Liu and our newest member, Jory Steele, for the breadth and variety of work that you take on. From program development and management, to career advising, to research, to teaching, to mother henning, and just to being terrific colleagues. 
And now it's also my pleasure to introduce someone else whose work, collegiality, and dedication to service I deeply respect, Professor Phil Malone, who directs our Yulesgard Intellectual Property and Innovation Clinic, and this year is the chair of our Public Interest Committee, to my gratitude. Um, he will provide an introduction to our Rubin Alumni Award recipient, Catherine Crump, Following Phil's remarks and Catherine's acceptance video, she sends her apologies, she had to do a TEDx talk in Rio de Janeiro. Um, Dean McGill, our leader and champion of public service, will then provide an introduction of our national awardee, Maria Elena, and we'll end the evening with Maria Elena's inspirational remarks. So, Phil. Well, thank you, Diane, and thanks mostly to all of you for being here tonight, but also for being part of what I'm learning as I now start my second year here at Stanford, is really this amazing public interest community, this amazing group of committed, dedicated, passionate public service workers that you all are and you are all becoming. It's really a pleasure to be here with you, uh, and it's a pleasure for me tonight to present the Miles L. Rubin Public Interest Award. This award recognizes an alum whose outstanding work has advanced justice and social change in the lives of vulnerable populations on a community, national, or international level. In particular, the Rubin Award is intended to highlight concrete and sustainable approaches and solutions to broad societal problems. I'm delighted to say that I can't think of anyone who fits the broad scope and the importance of this award than tonight's recipient, Catherine Crump. Catherine's a 2004 graduate of this law school, but her interest in and her dedication to public interest and public service dates back quite a bit earlier. In fact, to her arrival here at Stanford as an undergraduate. Uh, as an undergrad, Catherine spent two years volunteering with what was then the East Palo Alto Community Law Project, where she worked with our very own Jeannie Marino, who at that time oversaw the project's landlord-tenant work. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, and under Jeannie's guidance, Catherine helped low-income tenants remain in their homes. She was able to witness firsthand how the law and the skills of a lawyer could be used to benefit people and she soon knew what kind of career she wanted to have. It was this experience and the public interest mentoring of Jeannie that really sparked Catherine's interest in becoming a lawyer and in pursuing a public interest career. Uh, Catherine entered law school in the, here at Stanford in the fall of 2001, just two weeks after she began her first semester, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 took place. Soon afterward, within a month, Congress passed the USA Patriot Act. And Catherine's interests soon developed and began to focus on civil liberties, and especially on the intersection of technology and civil liberties. And she spent her time here at SLS working with lawyers from the Center for Internet and Society, and also interning with the Electronic Frontier Foundation on these broad <coughs> excuse me, on these broad issues of civil liberties and technology that were affecting the entire nation. After she graduated and clerked for the Ninth Circuit, Catherine was awarded an Equal Justice Works Fellowship. She joined the ACLU's national office in New York City, where she spent the next nine years focusing on the systemic national issues of online privacy, speech, and technology that had started to fascinate her in law school. In her time at the ACLU, Catherine had become, has become one of the nation's foremost experts on online speech and privacy rights. As a public interest lawyer, Catherine has litigated a number of high profile cases to ensure that Americans' privacy rights and other civil liberties are protected even as this variety of new technologies that surround us are adopted and become part of our everyday lives. Among other things, she uh, was involved in the ACLU's challenge to the NSA's mass collection of Americans' call records. She represented artists, media outlets, and others in challenging a federal internet censorship law. She handled cases protecting the right to engage in political protest. 
and she was responsible for challenges to the search and seizure of our laptops, cell phones, and other devices belonging, <clears throat> excuse me, belonging to American citizens at our borders, even when there's no suspicion that those devices contain any evidence of a crime. In addition, she's testified before Congress, written numerous op-eds, really pushed a public awareness and a public policy agenda on these vital issues that's second to none. Each of these cases and all of this work seeks to vindicate the rights of all Americans and the public interest to be free from government intrusion, government monitoring, and government overreach as we enter this amazing new technological world that we're in. Catherine's recently shifted from the ACLU chapter of her public interest life and her public interest career to a new chapter, but one equally dedicated to the public interest. She's now an assistant clinical professor of law and associate director of the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic at Berkeley Law School. It's a tech policy clinic much like the Jules Guard Clinic that I direct here at Stanford, one with a long and very strong record of standing up for civil liberties and the civil rights of all Americans. Catherine's an exceptional, exceptional recipient of the Miles L. Rubin Award. Unfortunately, as Diane said, she can't be here tonight because she's in Rio, giving a TED Talk somehow. <laughs> Seemed, you know, more like the things she had to do. Uh, but we're going to hear from her by video. But I just want to say before we do that, that for those of you who want to, you will be able to see and hear Catherine live. She'll be here on campus a week from Thursday on October 16th, uh, giving a lunch talk on exactly the sort of issues that she spent her career advancing. Talk is titled, After Snowden, Hot Topics in the Debate Over Mass Surveillance. That's a lunch talk a week from Thursday. And with that, I give you this year's Miles L. Rubin Award recipient, Catherine Crum. I'm truly honored to be this year's Miles L. Rubin Public Interest Award recipient. Although I'm now teaching at that other law school across the bay, I love Stanford so much that I actually enrolled twice, first as an undergrad and second as a law student. In fact, it was my early experience with Stanford Law School as an undergrad that made me decide I wanted to be a lawyer. When I came to Stanford for the first time, I was excited about everything, but I had no idea how to act how to answer that terrifying question adults would ask. What do you want to do when you grow up? An internship at the East Palo Alto Community Law Project with Jeannie Marino changed all of that. Um, I was just an undergrad, but I had the tremendous privilege to work with her, and her work was so inspiring. She represented low-income tenants, and because she had a law degree, was able to help them deal with situations like you know, uh, poor living conditions in their apartments or landlords who were abusive. And she made me realize that if you have a law degree, that's the way you can use the tremendous educational advantages that you've had for the benefit of people who haven't had the same advantages. I was hooked, not just on the idea of becoming a lawyer, but the idea of becoming a lawyer at Stanford Law School. When I got to Stanford, one of my favorite aspects of being a student here was the possibility of getting involved in working on actual cases and projects early so that I didn't have to wait two years. I was so excited about being a lawyer, I wanted to get started right away. Uh, one of my first experiences was actually working with the professor, Larry Leslie, uh, who had something like a dozen research assistants. And I was so excited uh, because I got to work on a Supreme Court brief with him. And I ran home to my parents and I said, Look at this footnote in this brief. I did the background research that many of you have It really, it was really a thrill for me. I got to talk to Mel in three young years. I had the opportunity to uh, explore the law school's uh, a clinical curriculum. Now, Stanford has come a long way in clinical education. Now there's something like a dozen clinics, and they operate in this beautiful renovated facility. When I was here, which was 10 years ago now, the clinics were in this dingy sub-basement, and it hadn't been renovated at all. But in a huge contrast to the facility, the work the clinics were doing was truly amazing. When I was a student, there was a cyber law clinic at Stanford, and it was taught by Jennifer Granick. Uh, you all now know her as the director of civil liberties for the Stanford Center for Internet and Society, but I was lucky enough to get to have her as my clinical teacher. 
And I actually just kind of did Berkeley that you that is a technology law and policy clinic. And many of the issues that I now work on with students, I encountered for the first time working with Jennifer. Uh, and that was a tremendous gift to me in shaping uh, the, the public interest career I've been able to have. Um, and, and the cases Jennifer brought were fantastic. One of my favorites, both for its human value, but also for what it says about our intellectual property system, was a case in which the clinic represented piggybankofamerica.com. Now, piggybank of America is exactly what it sounds like. It's a place where you could go online to a sort of handcrafted looking website and purchase a piggy bank. Well, Bank of America had an issue, Piggy Bank of America. <laughs> it said Piggy Bank of America had a cease and desist letter claiming that the use of Bank of America in the website's URL was some form of uh, infringement of its trademark. The clinic took the case and pushed back against that argument, patiently explaining to Bank of America that there was no probability of confusion that any of the Piggy Bank of America was some kind of official Bank of America product. Marco ultimately back down. <laughs> I'm still looking out to Jennifer and Judy. The fact of the matter is, a tremendous number of faculty members and staff, clinical and non clinical, were tremendously generous to being a student. They thought nothing of opening up their Rolodexes to the advantage of a 23 year old kid uh, to help her figure out and achieve what she wanted to do. Uh, in my case, it led to a near decade at the ACLU. I should back up and say that there was an event that shaped my law school class tremendously, which is that on the third day of classes in September of 2001, or what would have been our third day of classes, a horrible event at the World Trade Center occurred. And the next month, we watched Congress pass the Patriot Act. While I was at Stanford, I learned about the issues uh, the Patriot Act raised, the balance of power between privacy and security, uh, and the extent to which uh, the government is allowed to curtail individual freedoms in order to facilitate national security purposes. At the ACLU, I had the fabulous privilege of getting to work on those issues. It was a tremendous job, uh, and I felt privileged that I could go and look at something happening in the newspaper, and if I really wanted to try to do something about it, I could. I got to challenge the NSA's mass collection of Americans' telephone records, I got to represent journalists and criminal defense attorneys and private individuals uh, in a challenge to the government's efforts, uh, the government's policy of engaging in purely suspicionless searches of laptops and cell phones at the international border. And I had a tremendous opportunity uh, to represent many individuals challenging internet, inter internet censorship in its various forms. This is a fantastic career. Um, I loved it so much uh, that I ultimately went into teaching so that I could help other students find a similar path. Uh, so for all of these reasons, I'm just tremendously honored to have been given this public service award. Uh, but more than that, I am continually grateful for the education I received here. I'm Liz McGill, I'm the Dean of the Law School, and I'm delighted to see all of you here tonight. I, I wanted to add my, uh, my voice to Diane's voice in thanking the Levin family for uh, John and Terry and meeting Caroline tonight for what you've done for Stanford Law School. The community you see here uh, is very much uh, more robust and more connected to each other and more committed to what uh, advancing the cause of justice and freedom and the principles that we all care about as a result of your generosity with the school. So we're incredibly, incredibly grateful. I had one other thanks to offer, which is I don't know how often you've seen Diane Chin uh, talk about uh, the work of the Levin Center at Stanford Law School, but she thanks everybody except the person whose uh, shoulders we all stand on, which is Diane. Uh, so uh, in her, uh, with her incredible judgment and commitment and uh, leadership, she leads us all. So thank you, Diane. Thank you. I love this dinner too. Each year we gather, as Diane said, as a community to honor 
two inspiring public interest attorneys. We do this first and foremost because we are amazed at their accomplishment and what they've been able to do. We want to tell them we root for them, that we've noticed them, that we think what they're doing is incredible. We're amazed by what they've done, and we want to tell the world about it by recognizing the achievement. I think we do it for at least two other reasons, too, though. I think we do it to remind ourselves of a profound commitment that I think all of us share in this community, which is that people like us, people who have talent, education, and opportunity, have a profound obligation to give back. As the saying goes, to those much, have been, much has been given, much is expected. And I think this night reminds us of that too. I think the other reason we gather is to remind ourselves of something else. People who have a calling to help others, like the two attorneys we recognize tonight, can make a difference. They do make a difference, and they make a difference every day in the lives of the people they're helping. So we applaud the achievements and recognize the achievements, but we're also doing something to reaffirm our own commitments and our own belief that a great advocate can make a real difference in the lives of the people they're seeking to help. The National Public Service Award, as Diane said, was established to honor an attorney who's demonstrated outstanding commitment to public service in her career and has worked in a way that has had an impact nationwide. Recipients are leaders in their field who embody the tradition of public service that we are trying to instill in all of our students and in the community at Stanford Law School. Past winners include last year, Robbie Kaplan and Pam Carlin for their work on the Windsor case, uh, Judge Patricia Wald, Vernon Jordan, Brian Stevenson. It's a glittering uh, list of people who've accomplished a great deal. Ari Elena Hincapei is this year's National Public Service Award winner. Mari Elena, as you heard, is the executive director of the National Immigration Law Center, a national organization dedicated to defending and advancing the interests of low-income immigrants. When Mari Elena's nomination came in, and then again over this weekend, I've been reading about all that she's accomplished, and it's really uh, extraordinary and really too difficult uh, in a way to capture in a short comment. But let me identify three things that stand out about what Marielena has done and what people say about what she's done. First is something Diane alluded to. She's amazingly versatile. During these last many years of debate about immigration reform, the development of the Dreamers movement, what we're now experiencing as the crisis of unaccompanied minors coming across our borders, Marielena has taken on many roles of a successful social justice lawyer, the many roles that they must pursue. She's a litigator, she's a policy strategist, she's a voice of reason, she's a protester, she's a blogger, she's a media spokesperson, she's a team builder. Last year, she joined members of the labor, faith, and immigrants' rights communities in acts of civil disobedience to protest against the US immigration policies. Here is how one supporter of this nomination, Hiroshi Matamura of UCLA Law School, made this point. All of us who are involved in this work are acutely aware that it takes many skills and many perspectives on the problem to tackle it effectively. To name just three, we need to be connected with and deeply understand the communities for which we try to advocate. We need to be aware and generate the ideas that drive and organize our advocacy, and we need to find and deploy effective practical vehicles to influence decision making. Many advocates, Hiroshi says, are good at one of these things. Some very rare few are good at two, Almost none of us are good at all three, and of this very select group, it is exceedingly rare to find someone like Maria Elena, who not only does all three with skill and sensitivity, but in whom we see the power of each of these three ways of advocacy to harmonize with each other and reinforce their effectiveness. The second thing that stands out about Maria Elena's accomplishments is that her, is her capacity and that of her organization to be a voice of reason, reason and compassion in an area of policy where, how shall I say it, that is in rather short supply. Chris Ho, is an, who is an alumnus of Stanford Law School and directs the National Origin, Immigration, and Language Rights Program at the Legal Aid Society Employment Law Center, worked with Maria Elena long ago when she was a law student. Well, it's not that long ago. It's very recent, actually. <laughs> this is what he says. It feels shocking to realize that I've known Maria Elena since she was a 2L. I will always be glad that she never took my advice that she should become a litigator. 
Under Maria Elena's leadership, NILC has become a policy leader and resource for advocates that doesn't have a peer. In this period of time, where the debate over immigration usually sinks into acrimony, division, and self-serving political maneuvering, NILC has stood out as a voice of reason whose contributions to the national dialogue are unsurpassed. The third aspect of Maria Elena's career uh, is that her work and her achievements come out of a very profound commitment and connection to the community that she's serving, one that she tends to carefully, one that obviously fuels her passion, but also gains her respect and admiration of others. Stacy Tolchin, who's a prominent immigration attorney, put it this way, Maria Elena works nonstop to serve the immigrant rights community. She not only meets with the White House to negotiate a reform of the nation's laws, she also makes an impact on a very individual level. For instance, Maria Elena maintained a relationship with one of the children of a worker who was a victim of a workplace raid in South Car Southern California over five years ago. She still meets with this child to help her with her schoolwork. She helped the student write a letter to the president about the importance of immigration reform. While the student wrote the substance of the letter, Maria Elena helped her with her grammar to ensure that her message was conveyed as she intended. Maria Elena inspires generation of activists as well as her peers and her friends to give back and to make a difference in the lives of immigrants and their families. We couldn't be more pleased to honor you tonight and we're excited to hear what you have to say and we're looking for some inspiration. is overwhelming. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, um, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here and to be recognized. Um, I can tell I'm very emotional <laughs> by Stanford. And um, it takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a village to raise a public interest lawyer. <laughs> and you know, when I think of Hiroshi and Chris Ho and Stacy, people that I admire so deeply, um, it's just, it, it, this is an award that is not for me, right? This is an award that is really a recognition of my parents, Arturo and Teresa, who've passed away. It's a recognition of my entire team because, you know, I am one of the privileged people in this country that get to get paid. And I talked to Dean McGill about this this morning, like I get to get paid to lead an organization that was founded to help low-income immigrant families like mine. Like, who, who gets that privilege in life, right? And so it's really amazing. Um, and I want to thank Dean McGill and the Levin family for your support of the law school, and Diane Chin, who is the big sister to so many of us, not just SLS alum, but really so many of us in the public interest community who look to Diane for leadership and mentorship and who really see you as the type of lawyer that we want to be. Um, so it is really, really a true honor to be recognized by Stanford. I must say, Dean McGill, my parents probably did not even know that Stanford Law School existed. <laughs> uh, you know, they, my father was recruited to the United States to work at a textile factory. He was a temporary worker. Um, he came in 1970 and he realized that raising 10 children in Colombia was not possible at a time when there was so much economic and political turmoil. So he made the difficult decision after a number of years of being here to petition for my mother and the rest of us. Thank God it was before TSA and DHS days. <laughs> and my mother and my siblings, we immigrated in the 1970s at a time when the immigration laws were really different. We were able to come with green cards. We were able to really achieve the American dream that today is so illusory for so many immigrants who come for the same reasons that my parents came, right, for that American dream that many of your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents have come to the United States for. And my parents um, used to say very clearly to me that, you know, they would say, mija, no tenemos cosas materiales para dejarle, pero una educación es algo que nadie le puede quitar. You know, Mija, daughter, we don't have any material things to leave you, but an education is something that no one can ever take away from you. So I knew growing up in Central Falls, Rhode Island, which is this one square mile in the smallest state of the country, um, where there were textile factories at that time, very much like East Palo Alto, 
frankly. I mean, and that is my connection to EPA, to, to Stanford. I was rec remembering as I was hearing um, Catherine Crum speaking that you know, one of my last internships in law school was at the East Palo Alto the Community Law Project, um, and really learning so much from the attorneys there, including G. Marino and David, who did special education law, uh, and being so inspired by the work that all of you have been doing at Stanford. But my parents came to the United States for a better future for all of us, for my brothers and sisters, and. Again, my father had a second grade my, sec my father had a second grade education, my mother had a fifth grade education, and for them it was about accomplishing something that they didn't have. They made serious sacrifices, personal sacrifices to come to this country. And as I was growing up in Central Falls, frankly, my parents had a lot of ideas about what I should do. So there's always being a seamstress, because that's a very good, Colombia in particular, we have a very strong textile industry, which is my father, my parents learned and met each other in the textile factory. So being a seamstress was a good thing. Um, also hair salons. My father was like, that is a good business, because every woman wants to get her hair cut and her, get her nails done. So I was like, OK. But on the other hand, we had the encyclopedia at home. They invested. My mother had earned $2.10 on her factory job, and they invested to get us an encyclopedia to make sure that we read, and I had to read every page. They had no idea what we were reading, but they knew that we were reading and learning what the encyclopedia said. And I grew up in Rhode Island knowing that my parents had made a sacrifice, and they were really clear that they had come to this country for the American dream, and that we had a responsibility to give back to this country, and that we had a responsibility to leave this country better off than they found it when we got here. And that always stuck with me, that I had a responsibility, as Dean McGill said. And we all have a responsibility. Growing up in Rhode Island, in Central Falls in particular, in the 1980s, when the drug war was booming, unfortunately, I grew up a lot, um, just a, a, among a lot of drugs, both drug traffickers and drug users. And so, there was something inside of me from a young age that told me that I wanted to make a difference, that I really wanted to change the world, that my parents had made the sacrifice and that I had to do something that was different and I was gonna reject becoming a seamstress and becoming a hairstylist. And so as I graduated from high school, I decided that I was gonna become a DEA agent. That was how I was going to change the world. Can you imagine me, a drug enforcement agent? <laughs> I, yeah, thank goodness there were college professors who were like, oh, not law enforcement. Think about a pre-law career instead. And frankly, I, had, I knew no lawyers, did not even know what lawyers did, with the exception that when I was graduating from high school, before I started college, I got a job for the summer as a, I don't know, clerk or secretary assistant for the summer. And on the last day of my summer, it's just incredible that this would happen, um, the uh, secretary, the real secretary, Jackie, was out for lunch. And I'm sitting in her reception area. And it's kind of like the typical, traditional old doctor's offices where there's a reception and there's a window and then you buzz somebody in. And I'm sitting there at lunchtime. And these big guys, white guys, come in. And they're like, is Bobby Testa here? And I'm like, no, he's not available. And this is a lawyer's name that I worked for. And, uh, and quickly they show DEA badges, and they bust in, and they bust Bobby Testa, who was there, but I had been told to say he was not there, doing coke at his desk. And Bobby Testa gets detained for, he gets arrested for not only drug trafficking, he represented a lot of the Colombian drug dealers, I must admit, my people, <laughs> my Colombian peeps who were very involved in drug trafficking at the time. Um, Bobby Testa gets detained for drug trafficking or aiding and abetting, but also for some prostitution ring, apparently. So that was my only, my only exposure to lawyers. So here I am going to college thinking I want to bust every drug dealer in my community because they've been harming my community. I wanted to put all of them in jail. And my family was so petrified. They were like, really? Can't you pick something else for a career? Like a hair salon sounds really good. Really, DA, they're going to come after every drug, every Colombian drug dealer is going to come after our family and, and 
kill us, <laughs> right? And so um, I was very determined. I wanted to change the world, and I wanted to become a DEA agent, went to college. My college professors were like, no, think about a pre-law. As I learned about the criminal justice system, I learned about all of the inequities in our system, about the racism, about the injustices in the criminal um, in the penal system and realized like it was not for me. It was really, I thought maybe I would pursue a career in education because education was an equalizer. It made a big difference in my family. Um, my parents didn't have a formal education, but I know that my father could have been a neurologist. My father was so damn smart. He self became self-educated and used to read two to three books a week. He was up on all of the politics of the world. And he could have become a the president of a country. He could have been a neurosurgeon. He could have been anything he wanted to be if he had the opportunities. And my mother, talk about time management. My mother had 13 kids. I am living proof that the Catholic Church rhythm method does not work. I was 13 pregnancy. Unwanted pregnancy, number 13. and But she was a manager. She could have been a CEO. She could have run any Fortune 500 company. She ran the finances. She put us, had us, like, just knew everything we needed to know about life. And my mother, although she had a fifth grade education, was really amazing at Spanish grammar. And before I started kindergarten in the United States, she taught me how to read and write in Spanish. And my brothers and sisters who were struggling as teenagers in our public school system kept telling my mother, mommy, you are confusing her. You are going to mess up her life because she was going to enter school so confused that she is not going to learn English. And my mother's like, no, she's going to learn English in this country, so she needs to learn Spanish. She's going to learn English in the school system. She has to learn Spanish first. My mother taught me how to read and write Spanish, which was brilliant. Because when I started kindergarten, I acquired the English skills so much faster. You know, and the fact that today, although I came to this country at three years old, I am completely bicultural and bi bilingual is an anomaly. And so many of our children, children of immigrants who have lost their language because their parents are afraid that they won't be able to succeed in our country. My mother was brilliant ahead, again, Fortune 500 CEO. And so after some time went by and I decided to go to law school and really had the opportunity to understand what my family's experiences had been. I had grown up in Central Falls. I had grown up interpreting for so many of our family members. I knew what the social, I knew what the unemployment office, what the welfare office, what the social security office, all of those offices before I went to law school. And so understanding the barriers and obstacles that so many poor people in this country, not just Latinos, not just immigrants, black people, working poor, working whites, working women who are struggling. I am a product of CETA, right, of the Job Training Program Act. I used to go to the local park to get a lunch, free lunch, during the summer when my mother was working so we could survive. If my parents didn't have access to unemployment when they had when they were laid off from their jobs during their seasonal, when the low, jobs were low during the factories, we would not have survived. But all, all of those support systems are gone today. Low-income immigrants are struggling in this country. We have growing inequality. And we're supposed to somehow make it on our own. And it takes a village. It really, truly takes an entire country to really step up to say, no, we are going to support people and we're going to provide those support systems that they need to fulfill their human, full human to potential. And that's why, as I said earlier, for me, it's such an honor to be leading an organization like the National Immigration Law Center. We believe that every individual in this country, regardless of where they were born or how much money they have in their pocket, or whether they even have a bank account or have the legal right to open a bank account, that every single one of us should have the same tools and opportunities, the same rights to fulfill our full human potential. And as you all are part of this legal community, this legal profession, the public interest community that Stanford Law has been such a vanguard and a leader in in our country, we have responsibilities. We have to make sure that we are pushing the envelope, that we're holding our elected officials accountable. The legal tools could be used for good and for bad. We've seen it throughout our history. We've seen it with slavery. We've, we've seen it when women have not had the right to vote. We've seen it as recently as Ferguson. 
right? When the legal tools are used to disenfranchise, to actually diminish the advantages and create disadvantages, when entire segments of our society could be excluded from our rights, when entire segments of our society could actually be oppressed, or when the legal tools could be used actually to create opportunities, to be inclusive so that we all have the opportunity to fulfill our full human potential, and the legal tools can be used as a form of liberation for entire parts of our community. And we get to choose what direction we go in. And again, as members of this public interest community, I would hope and implore that we each are going to use our legal responsibilities, our privilege as law students, lawyers, supporters, donors, law professors, whatever role you play in our community to make sure that we are truly working to achieve justice and to work with local community members to achieve power for our communities. In closing, I will just say that in the last years, as we at the National Immigration Law Center have worked hard for the rights of low-income immigrant families in this country, I've found myself in uh, challenging and exciting opportunities. And one of those has been in meeting with the president. I've met with him a number of times, but one of the meetings that I had with him was very recently. It was on June 30th. And I had gotten a phone call on Thursday afternoon, um, and I'm sorry, on Friday afternoon, and then had to get onto a plane to be there for a Monday morning meeting with the president. And that was also the morning that the president had sent a letter to Capitol Hill asking for additional funding and expanded legal authority uh, to deal with the so-called border crisis of the unaccompanied children coming from Central America. The president wanted to meet with us to let us know that he had finally decided to use his executive authority and to change, to use his authority to make the policy changes that are needed, drastically needed in this country, because Congress is failing to act. He had had a conversation with Speaker Boehner uh, about a week beforehand. Speaker Boehner said, I'm sorry, President, I don't have the votes, and there's no way that we are going to get legislative immigration reform done this year. And the President said, OK, well, you leave me no choice but to act. I am going to have to use my executive authority. So the President was coming with good news to our meeting, except that that morning they decided, the White House decided that it wanted to expand its legal authority to deport children faster. And I have to say to you, every single time that I've met with the President, I've been so aware of my privilege, aware that my parents never in their lifetime imagined that I would be sitting across from the President of the United States. I never imagined. And I've been very conscious as I sit there and look at him to say, this is one of the most important people in the world, superpower of the world that we represent. And to sit there that day on June 30th and to remind the President that we have a duty as a country, as a nation in this global world, to make sure that we are not returning children, that we are not returning refugees to their persecutors. And I have to admit, it was extremely disappointing to hear the President literally say to me, oh, Maria Elena, really, you're going to raise due process concerns? What do you want me to do? And he was so frustrated, and he was so concerned about what happened if he allowed these children to stay in the United States, and whether next year 100,000 would come, and the following year 150,000. And I had to remind the president, who's a constitutional law professor, that we have responsibilities as a nation, that domestic and international laws require us not to return refugees to their persecutors. And as of now, the LA Times has reported that some of the children from Honduras who have been deported have already been killed. And to know that our nation is actually engaging in some of the most unconstitutional and un-American practices is heartbreaking. A couple of weeks later, I was able to travel with our legal team to Artesia, New Mexico. We flew into El Paso, Texas, and traveled four hours to Artesia, which is one of the places where mothers and children from Central America are being detained. These are jails that are being paid by each of us, our tax dollars. 
are holding mothers and children in our jails. And the first boy that I met with and his mother, I introduced myself, explained why we're there. And Saul, who's 13 years old, said to me, today's my birthday. Hoy es mi cumpleaños. And I could not believe, and I have to say, for days after that, Saul's face has stayed with me to think, how is it that this 13-year-old boy is spending his birthday in our jails because he was escaping trauma? How is it that the mother who told me that after her daughter was trying to reject the gang members from making her their price, and she rejected sleeping with them. When she went to denounce that to the local police, the next day the gang members had put, posted a flyer to her, to her door, letting her know she, they knew she had gone to the police, and that they were requiring that she pay $18,000 in renta, this rent that they require as a tax and that if she didn't pay $18,000, her daughter would be raped and they would all be killed. She left. She left El Salvador. Any mother, anybody would do the same thing. And so in our nation, we must uphold our basic fundamental rights, our constitutional rights, not for political reasons, the way it's happening right now, but to make sure that we as a nation are doing everything we can be doing to uphold our basic constitutional rights, our civil rights, our due process, our human rights. And so tonight, in closing, I would just ask that every single one of you, throughout your legal profession, throughout your legal career, whether you are a law student right now or a professor, a practicing lawyer, a supporter of the law school, that you ask, am I doing enough? Am I doing enough to try to prevent the Michael Browns of the world to be killed by racial profiling from our police officers? Am I doing enough to prevent Saul, the 13-year-old, from ending up as he's fleeing persecution in our detention systems? Am I doing enough to prevent the undocumented worker who is retaliated against and because she wasn't paid for her wages ends up in our jails when the employer retaliates against her? And that is our responsibility to constantly ask ourselves, what more can I do? Because I know that the Stanford Law School upholds a value and a vision for our country that we share at the National Immigration Law Center, which is that every single one of us should be aspiring to use the legal tools we have at our disposal, our privilege as legal professions to achieve justice and power for and with our local communities. Gracias.